you've got to be more creative. There's got to be more flexibility. And I think that the big challenge is the way that a lot of these organizations plan, you know, 12, 18 months out, that is a real challenge to try and shift and move. It can be done, but it's pretty behemoth in some of the larger brands to be able to do that. No matter what size you are, you've, you've got to think about what you can do at that local level. This is about being uh, uh, becoming a retail street fighter again. <laughs> you know, it's about being street smart and, and acting like an entrepreneur all over again. And I don't care how big your company is or how small it is. This is the, this is the, the, the where the rubber hits the road right now. And mm-hmm. that you've got to become very, very creative. Um, but you're going to have to do one thing, you know, whether it's marketing, merchandising, you know, e-commerce, social media, or the supply chain itself is you're going to have to ask yourself one question continuously and not get depressed over everything, but keep asking one question. What else can we do? As retailers entered the lockdown in March 2020, a small, diverse group of Canadian thought leaders gathered to virtually speculate, collaborate, and share their insights on the waves of disruption facing retailers. The Business of Retail podcast emerged as an unflinching strategic alternative to the conventional discourse, revealing challenges in the headlines and exploring new, unconventional paths for all facets of the retail industry. Now, here's the panel. Welcome to the Business of Retail podcast. Uh, Today we are a bit of a smaller group. It's myself, David Ian Gray. We've got Gary Newbery, George Minakakis, and Christine Cowan. And we're uh, we're extending a conversation uh, for our audience that we began offline, which was uh, with all the chaos that's happening out of the supply chain right now, what can happen inside? We can't solve the offshore issue, but we certainly are faced with having to satisfy the idea that people are walking into our store and they're looking for things on shelves and it may not be what they expect is there and what they are expecting may not be there. How do we adapt to that on the fly right now? Uh, So we are the Business of Retail podcast. I'm glad you've tuned in. Please uh, subscribe to us if you like what you're about to listen to. Let's sort of kick right off right now and, uh, and, and try and help the people that are, are dealing with this issue here and now today on the front lines. I posted something about a week ago and it had to do with um, you know, the, you know, what a CEO should be doing, the five things a CEO should be doing. Um, it had about 15,000 views, which is okay. But somebody wrote me a, a note and it said that George... I've always been told, and this guy's from, um, um, from the IT world, he said, I've always been told that retail is easy. He goes, anybody ever, anybody ever says that to me again, I'm going to show them this list and tell me, tell, and said, show them, tell me how this is easy. Yeah. Right? But it, it highlighted the amount of work, work and then everyday work that a CEO should be doing right now to address the next 24 months. Yeah. And I think the challenge, <laughs> the challenge is difficult. And I'll tell you right now, if you're a small mom and pop with one door, it's a hell of a lot easier to figure out how to reassort a store based on lack of product and make it compelling than it is to do it across a, you know, massive chain of stores that, you know, potentially is global. You you know, Christine, but after you've run, after you've sold though, I think you sold those goods, the supply chain is still not fixed. How are you going to get them? Let's reboot our conversation. Yeah, no, I mean, but I I think it kind of goes back to like a smaller door has the capability to say, okay, here's all the things I've ordered. Half of it isn't coming in. I'm going to shift my focus. If it was on candles and candles aren't coming, I'm going to focus on, you know, throws, blankets, because I've got tons of those and I can order those quickly and I've got a distributor who can get them to me tomorrow. So I think like it's that situation versus a large scale store of a huge brand that has got one singular focus on a shoe or a piece of clothing across the entire platform of stores and or wholesaler retailers, um, they're SOL, like they've got to shift and do something different and it's not going to be I, the case in every door. Just listen to what you're saying, Christine. It, 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 as, I, as I'm listening, the cogs are turning. It, it's clear to me that the you can't manage this from afar, from head office and, and storytell across the network with all it, very different stages of where they've got to, with what might be coming in or not. So somehow each store has to refine its way of marketing itself. 
So this is moving from the concept of, yes, of course, we're personalized, you know, everything's personalized from our view of a consumer, we're personalizing our offer. But actually, the bit that's missing in this whole puzzle is the store. The store's not part of that equation. It's getting edicts from head office to say, you must merchandise and this, this is coming in, you're being allocated this. The store's being done to rather than we have to turn that on its head and say the store knows the consumers. Guess what? It's seeing them every day. It knows what it's got. It knows what its consumers are interested in doing, and it mm-hmm. needs to have the resource and uh, learn that, relearn that skill to re-merchandise that store, tell that story at a local level. Yeah, and that's the challenge is a lot of major retailers are not set up like that. It's it's funneled out through the headquarters. The message is there. It's, you know, massive dollars are spent to tell the story of that one or two singular products. And then when that doesn't happen, like the store is not equipped to have the ability, like their directives are coming. They'll have like merchandising assortments. They'll have all the directives of what needs to be done in the store. Not that they can't do it, but like that's how they've operated their whole lives. So all of a sudden then you're telling them, well, it's up to you now to figure out how you're going to sort the T-shirts and the shorts and the baseball caps. And, you know, I think a lot of um, store managers and store staff just are not used to that. They're used to the directive of we go in and we change it out and this goes there and this goes there and that's how they do it. So and it's, the advantage then should go to a dealer network, like if it's like home hardware or PharmaSafe, where the it's part of a, a, a larger network, but they're either franchise or dealers should have an edge over the next few months. Yeah, yeah I mean, should. potentially a franchisee, if they have the ability to be more nimble in what they're doing and are not accountable to the headquarters, absolutely, they could look at what the inventory situation is and adjust accordingly. Uh, But you're still going to have, from a franchisee perspective, you're still going to have certain metrics and expected, um, you know, assortment plans and focus, because again, they're still going to be promoting like whether it's Christmas lights or stockings or whatever else it is. Um, And if you shift too much, then, you know, again, that's, it's a huge financial loss. Um, but, but if there's no stock, it, my view would be like anyone who has their own business has that level of ownership will just do it because your your livelihoods, yeah, it, you don't. And, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, I think a lot of small independents are really compelling and exciting because if you walk in there, they're changing their assortments around sometimes on a daily basis. There's a, a couple of great stores down here where they're really, really beautifully merchandised and they change it up quite regularly. And it's very compelling and interesting because it's unique and it's not like everybody else. Well, my, okay. So my pet peeve isn't just what's getting promoted in the flyers, but it's when you go into a store and you really see those empty shelves and it is kind of jarring. And then you kind of feel like this isn't that fun to shop. And I wonder if everything else is out of stock too in here. You would think there's creativity that could come into play in, in terms of covering for that instead of just leaving bear zones well i i also think we have to remember that the bear zone might be there today but you might go in tomorrow and they're expecting a shipment and the shelf will be fixed you know the next day so there's that element of it as well like absolutely if they know inventory is not going to come in for a couple weeks it shouldn't be a bear shelf but you know again that's the challenge. It's like, they don't want to go and shift and move the whole thing if they're they're expecting inventory. And again, they're expecting inventory on a day and then maybe it doesn't show up for three days later. There's just that push and pull of the challenge of what do you do in the meantime? I think there's some theater that could be done and it doesn't mean you sell in those spaces, but there's something else you can do with them. Even if you're dropping a screen. Coming soon. There is, there is. And (laughs) and, and it's called, there is, and it's visuals. You could have printed visuals. You can, you know, there's ways to block to block parts of departments to, to you know, to close it off and fill up the other department, the other sections of the stores. If you're but sophisticated would... and creative, you'll do it. Hey, hey, Christine, you were being funny, but I actually like that. Even if you had met it head on and just had a coming soon drop sheet and maybe something funny underneath saying, Whenever we get, whenever the next tanker hits, the uh, freighter hits the Your port. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, you can, yeah. I mean, at least have a laugh with it for crying yeah. out loud. Yeah. yeah. Our, no, I, or I our ship is be, sunk. Yeah, I mean, I think something like that, but 
trying to, you know, again, it's, it's a constant daily challenge to reassort and do all of that. And I'll tell you right now, like they don't have the staff to do it. They've got staff that need to be selling and not focused on reassorting the stores like every day or two. It's just, it's not set up well for that. Uh, but uh, I bet you right now, the larger, the larger retailers have, who've had excess product in some stores have moved that product to stores that didn't have enough. That has already happened with the more sophisticated retailers. Yeah. The smaller ones, independents, you're right, Christine. They they can get creative, right? And with the bed sheet and a, and a crayon, if they have to, yeah. they'll do it, yeah. right? But it's a great message. And you know what? I think consumers, the consumer's heart is really good when it comes to the independents, particularly if someone who's a, who's an honest player, Right. Yeah. And they know they've been they, they work hard at trying to, to serve the customers and they've been consistent. I don't think they'll have a problem uh, over time. My challenge for everybody here is that, OK, you've mer- you re-merchandised, you've sold out, which mostly have. What do you do in January or February? You know, oh. And the ship still hasn't come in. Yeah, well, the, ship, the ship's going to come in. And then what? And I, I think there's a scenario at play here where there's massive, massive sell-offs that are going to happen in February, March. Unless Maybe. it's inventory that they can kind of... Non-seasonal, yeah. Something. Something. yeah. Well, yeah. We, we got, like Gary, we got a whole bunch of uh, flyers that came in. One one for toys, another one for gadgets and stuff. And and I looking at, I was just going through them and thought, oh, look, the toys, the toys looked like they came out of the 1970s. Um, they, they looked like they scraped together what uh, they couldn't they couldn't sell 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And it's in there. But, you know, I'm thinking of little kids today, you know, t- eight to 10 year olds. They don't they're not interested in this stuff. They want they want technology. They want hardware in their hands. You know, and that's not that's not there you now. So I'm, I'm really curious when you got a company like Apple who says it's going to be tough to get product in and you may have to wait a little longer. I can only imagine that electronics up, up for kids, other electronics are probably going to, they're one officer. Maybe they've got a dozen of each. And once they sell out of those, they sell out of those. And there's won't be, uh, if you sell out of items that are wanted, there won't be a big fire sale at Mm -hmm. the end of the season. Well, what's also interesting. So back to the independent conversation, um, I was in an independent, they didn't have inventory and something I was looking for, but they were incredibly helpful in the fact that they said, look, we can get it. We're going to take your name. We're going to get back to you on when the ETA is. And, you know, by the way, if you want it, we can ship it to you wherever you are. So in that case, I'm like, fabulous. I I know I want this product. I know I've, you know, it's a great, reputable store. Uh, They called me immediately back, said, we found it. We can do this. We can do that. Like the customer service piece really came into play there. And again, that's a harder thing with some of these bigger um, chain stores to be able to have that level of customer service. But I would argue in the old days of department stores, like, you know, some would be calling you saying, oh, it's, um, you know, it's that time of year again, and we're going to have a deal on socks or underwear or whatever it is that you buy from them and come on in and we'll, we'll set you up. So, um, but we've just, we've lost that, you know, element. It's sort of, we're missing that customer service kind of piece of it. So you know, I think the independents can do that and can shift and say, hey, we don't have this, but we've got these other things and um, and just have a conversation and build the trust and the loyalty versus mm-hmm. the big box. It's sort of like, well, we're not really sure and we might get it. And we're not. And um, and they're not calling you back to tell you that something's coming in. They just don't have the staff, the manpower to do it, unfortunately. That's right. I think this is a great time for the digital marketers to kind of come off of Facebook and all the other things that they've been spending a fortune on and actually going to their websites and finding people's details um, and finding a, a situation that there's to, to bring a coordination between what's available obviously in the warehouse or wherever is for the e-commerce side. But more importantly, what is the, the plan for the, the, the store for the next few days and pull that in in some way into the digital flight and send that out and allow the customer to say, I want to shop from this store and tell me what the story is here. Oh, um, and then I I don't know how they might be able to do this, but to say, well, it's not available there, but do you want to try this store, sir? Or do you want us to ship it to you by e-commerce? I think this is a time for great creativity, using the, the technology that could be out there 
and may be already in many companies, but isn't joined together because the emphasis has been particularly on supply chain. And maybe this uh, thing that you talked about last time, uh, Christine, was sort of trying to be nimble. But I think there are some tools that um, retailers of various sizes, sometimes small, but pro- probably given to the mid to, to larger size, where we can actually use their digital marketing team to, to reflect what's in the store, what's available, and to push that directly to people in those localities. Well, there's there's a lot of functionality around, you know, you look at something and then they're like, if you like this, you might like this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that that's too far off to say, hey, and you really like this, we're out of it, but here's three alternatives for you. What do you think? You know, And I think today's consumer, if they really um, are flexible to it, then they'll most likely say, yeah, okay, that's close enough. I'll take that, you know, I'll take that versus the other. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just, you've got to be more creative. There's got to be more flexibility. And I think that the big challenge is the way that a lot of these organizations plan, you know, 12, 18 months out, that is a real challenge to try and shift and move. It can be done, but it's pretty behemoth in some of the larger brands to be able to do that. Yep. Gary, I think the, the one thing that caught my attention, what you just said was not only would you like a B or C product, but at the following store at the following yeah. stores. So there's a geolocator aspect to that, that I, I would admit, I haven't really seen too much before. So that, that could be pretty cool. And that could be an innovation that carries on long past uh, this, this era. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to say that uh, this is, this is about being uh, uh, becoming a retail street fighter again. You know, it's about being street smart and, and acting like an entrepreneur all over again. And I don't care how big your company is or how small it is. This is the, this is the, the, the where the rubber hits the road right now. And mm-hmm. that you've got to become very, very creative. Um, but you're going to have to do one thing, you know, whether it's marketing, merchandising, you know, e-commerce, social media, or the supply chain itself is you're going to have to ask yourself one question continuously and not get depressed over everything but keep asking one question what else can we do yeah i thought you're gonna do the eastwood uh do you feel lucky punk (laughs) no no not this time (laughs) no this is this is really heartfelt is to keep asking what else can we do because it opens up the thought process and keeps challenging yourself to any organization whether it's one store or a thousand and it also shifts the conversation so rather than the organization constantly pushing the merchandising and the planning strategy down to their doors, you need to have the conversation with the people on the floor and by geography or whatever else to be able to have that pull conversation of, you know what, like that's not working. This is what's going to work. We need to shift here. We need to do this. And that becomes a very huge, complex conversation when you're dealing with you know, mass doors globally. Well, um, and a plus on that, it's going to be where you have cultures that are very, very top down. It won't even work. It'll blow up. So you, you need sort of a culture where people have been empowered for a little while and they feel, you know, they, they can trust that they can make some of those decisions without getting crapped on. Right. Because mm-hmm. otherwise you're a deer in the headlights. It's, it must be awful feeling in, in, in that position. Mm-hmm. But the one thing I think is, you know, the truth of the matter is the customer's not king right now. And I think I think people kind of get that, that it's a little trickier out there. But I feel like one element that's missing, with a rare exception, that I kind of saw solved in Robin Lee of Lee Valley Tools' uh, letter to his, his customers a couple of weeks ago, is just a very transparent communication not just the flyers telling you to come in and buy stuff and maybe it's in stock or not, but a conversation around what's going on here, not just generically in the industry, but with our company, what are we dealing with? And if we're asking you to shop early, give a really compelling reason. And the message I'm never hearing is come back again because the stock out isn't permanent. We just don't know when it's arriving. So I think just, uh, you know, the industry's jumped on this message of shop early, but I think that could be a problem um, if it's not coupled with, hey, it might be in next week. We don't know. Just keep trying and check online. And that online inventory system better be accurate. Yeah. But the reality is, and I have to do this 
it's the independents. They have a lot of risk on their plate right now because what the inventory they have is the inventory they have. It's not like a big retailer who's got product that maybe they're going to have to go into the trenches and, you know, into the dark rooms that they haven't opened up in years and drag it out. Right. They don't, they have, they have one opportunity here and they're waiting for all that to the rest of it to come in. There's a risk mid-sized players and even larger ones who don't have the financial resources. They're going to have challenges also. So, I mean, I'm not going to, I don't want to paint a color, I paint something here that says, you know, it's, it's going to be, everything's going to be great. You just got to be smart. And you, and, and once when you get out of this, when we get out of this, where all of us would have learned some very valuable lessons, which is how to future proof our businesses from that, by ever having this happen again yeah. to us. That's the lesson. If we can survive. We need, I would add, uh, we need to deploy uh, things like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever it is in this situation, because we've been, uh, retailers have almost allowed themselves as they've tried to develop wideness moving into different categories, their skew count has just mushroomed. And so it's very hard even for somebody like me who can look at lots of different numbers and try and fit theorise in, 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 in one's brain about how this all fit together. You can't, honest. It's not an Excel spreadsheet. It's way beyond an Excel spreadsheet. You've got you know, 500 stores, 70, 80, 100,000 SKUs, all in different places, and you've got stuff on its way in. Trust me, you can only solve this with things like AI. Gary, it sounds like you're saying the retailers should be offering up surprise boxes uh, for all their <laughs> customers. And you just load whatever you got that day. Hey, listen, uh, lots to chew on. And I think, uh, you know, some of the things we're talking about, of course, are going to take time to develop and uh, this this problem is not going to go away anytime soon, so it's probably worth looking at. But I think there's a number of things that that can be done nimbly, as nimbly as possible in the moment right now over the next month. And and as the group said, maybe it's a little bit easier. Maybe that gives an edge back to the independents. But uh, uh, you know, I think no matter what size you are, you've you've got to think about what you can do at that local level. You have been listening to the Business of Retail podcast, an unflinching strategic alternative to the conventional industry discourse. Thank you for joining us. For more information, please go to www.thebusinessofretail.ca.